Good morning, everyone. I'm glad everyone had their coffee right before my talk, so everyone's got a lot of energy, I guess. Uh, so my name is Jimmy Bogard. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at jbogard. Um, I do a lot of work on GitHub, so you can find this presentation as well as like code examples and stuff on my GitHub at github.com slash jbogard. And I blog about this topic and a lot of other stuff on my blog at jimmybogard.com. A few things about me, uh, I get some award from Microsoft. I don't know why, they never tell us why, but it gets me free stuff, so hooray. Um, I work for a consulting company out of Texas called Headspring. And a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today are a lot of lessons learned from uh, large-scale projects that I've been on while at my time at Headspring. I do a lot of open source stuff as well, so if you're in the .NET community, those might mean something to you, but otherwise, um, I do a lot of open source stuff. And so today, we're gonna to be talking about uh, vertical slice architecture. Has anyone ever heard this term, vertical slice? Like a few people, um, probably because I made it up. Uh, and so that's probably why no one's really heard of it. It's just something that, uh, uh, that we started to do in our projects and our systems um, as a reaction to a lot of the kinds of architectures that I had been seeing uh, not really working too well. And so I want to focus on one of these systems that I was looking at uh, that kind of took this kind of this layered architecture to the worst possible extreme uh, and ended up with just kind of a, a big pile of uh, chocolate ice cream, I think? No. Um, so as, as part of my consulting, uh, we do a lot of custom software development. So most of what I do is actually just building, building systems, but sometimes I get to look at other people's systems. And I know that when they're calling me, like things have really gone bad because, uh, you know, if, 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 if it's so bad that you have to bring in outside consultants to tell you like, how, how big this pile is or how smelly it is, um, then I know things are pretty bad. Um, and so this is a system where I found um, basically like the, the, the inmates were running the asylum. This is a very small application from kind of the, the user perspective. It's basically four screens, that's pretty much it. Uh, some basic workflow, like approvals and things like that. Had some role-based security, this was like there's administrators and, and regular users. But to accomplish four screens, and this is not like a JavaScript application, this is like a regular web app, they had 20,000 lines of code to build just four screens. And to, and to accomplish this, there are actually two deployed applications and two different source control repositories with two solutions and 12 individual projects to build an application with four screens. And it's just like, how, how do you, how do, I, really, I, how do you do this? Um, how, do you, how do you write 20,000 lines of code to build something that's just a very basic kind of system and basic application? Um, so what I like to do in these systems is try to t trace one request throughout the entire application to see what are all the things that have to happen in order to accomplish just like showing some information on the screen. Now this system was built in about 2014, 2015, um, and despite it being like a lot of kind of modern systems and architectures, they decided to first of all pick a bunch of technologies that were obsolete five years before that. So it started out uh, poorly because it, had, it was using web forms. Um, <laughs> which no one, should, no one should have used back then and no one should use today. So that was like my first warning was like, this is using web technologies that shouldn't be used. Okay, whatever, let's keep digging. So ASPX has this code behind, okay. So uh, I see the HTML one thing and the code behind is kind of the first initial set of business logic. Um, but that code behind didn't have a logic in it. Uh, it really delegated to a service proxy. And so a service proxy was a wrapper on top of a WCF service. Um, so they actually had two things. They had the custom proxy they created plus the built-in one that was coming from WCF. And again, if you've never used WCF, it's one of the worst kinds of communication technologies you can imagine, um, basically built by uh, people that didn't know how developers would actually use it. And so uh, really, really difficult and annoying to use. Okay, so that was solution number one. So at this point, if a, if, a, if a developer needed to make a change to the application, um, they would first have to go to this part, add code to the web form, add code to the code behind, add code to the service proxy, add code to the other service proxy, and then go to the other solution and the other source control repository where we actually have the actual service. That wasn't actually doing anything, of course. Uh, that delegated actually to a business application layer. I knew it was the business application layer because that was the name of the project. It was called BAL. And I was like, what does BAL mean? It's like, that's the business application layer. Okay, of course it is. Um, that's delegated down to the data application layer or DAO. 
Uh, and I'm like looking through all these things and I'm still not seeing any actual behavior in the system. I'm tracing through all these different touch points, but nothing's actually happening yet. It's like, well, where's, where's the actual code of the system? Where does the actual business logic lie? <laughs> a store procedure, of course. So I'm looking at this and like, how, if I'm a developer, how do I know where code is supposed to go? If I'm adding a new feature to the system, um, how do I know the things are supposed to be in business logic versus data access logic? If I'm adding a new field to a screen, something that's, that's kind of my, my measuring stick for how easy it is to change a system. If I want to add a input to a screen, how easy is that for me to do? In this case, I'd have to touch nine different places to be able to just add something, or eight different places to be able to add something to the screen, even though the sort of procedures were like where the things are actually happening. So, you look at this, you're like, okay, no one's, you know, like maybe this company did this, but like in the real world, we don't actually do these sorts of things, right? Um, we typically have some kind of tiered architecture. And the traditional anti architecture that we were kind of all taught or, or shown in the early 2000s looks something like this, where I have the user interface layer, I have the business logic layer, which is where the business logic is supposed to go, allegedly. Um, then the data access layer, which is uh, some kind of wrapper, eventually over the database. Now, for those of you that were following domain-driven design, like this, this was bad, right? So we had our own flavor of interior style architectures. And so we kind of changed the names of some of these things, but it was basically the same, where I've got a user interface. Um, instead of having a business logic layer, we called these services instead, uh, which is much more descriptive, right? Um, we have repositories instead of a data access layer. Um, and then what we're supposed to have is a lot of behavior pushed out into our domain. Now, uh, I've taken this kind of architecture to its logical extreme, where we built very, very large systems that had this kind of structures. And what we found is that this kind of structure uh, actually prevented us from building uh, good, uh, good designs in the end. And a lot of the reasons we saw is because this forced us into organizing our application into these horizontal layers that would stretch across the entire application. So for example, if I had something like a person um, in my database, I have a person table, well, I'd also have a person object that matches that person uh, table. Um, if I need to interact with that in the user interface, there's a person controller. Um, the actual business logic is, is going to be in the person service. And finally, I encapsulate all the data access in a person repository. And you look at this and like, well, that makes logical sense, right? You have a place for user interface logic, for business logic, and for data access logic. But we found in practice, it didn't, the, 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 the pictures weren't actually nearly as clear here. And we actually looked at the systems to see how these different pieces connect together. We found that none of these kinds of designs actually adhere to the original solid principles that we were setting out to put in place. So solid, uh, solid principles being single responsibility principle uh, for whatever single responsibility means, the open-close principle, the Liskov substitution principle, which is something about inheritance, I think, um, the interface segregation principle, and finally, the dependency inversion principle. I think I got all those right, I think. Um, and so we looked at this, we're like, uh, there's a lot of like arrows going everywhere. Are we sure that this is what a solid design is supposed to produce? All these different connections going everywhere? And we found that uh, we were running into a lot of even just, just like basic merge conflicts with source control. Because if a, you, if a developer needed to make a change in the system, they were having to change a lot of the same files that other developers were changing as well. So if I'm coming in here and I say, well, you know, controllers can't talk directly to data access. They have to go through a service to do it instead. Well, we built all these services around the entity. So we had like a person service and a student service. And these services were really trying to encapsulate the logic around specific operations. But what if a service needed to call something else uh, from another service? Well, we may have connections between these different layers as well. So even though that we were trying to avoid this kind of tangled picture of just kind of a uh, big ball of mud, um, what we found is that by, by approaching it with this kind of horizontal tiered architecture, it didn't actually produce a cleaner result at the end. And so we'd have to have all these different um, meetings and stuff about, okay, who's touching this file? Who's touching that file? So at the end of a project where we took this to its logical stream, I said, I just threw up my hands and said, this, this is ridiculous. We're not actually producing better code. What if we just got rid of all of this, um, this kind of conventional wisdom, threw it out, all of it out the door, and started with the dumbest thing that could possibly work and figure out 
Now let's take a step back and say, okay, what is this actually, you know, what are the actual patterns that we want to uh, evolve towards? The other thing we saw was that developers that were needing to make, needing to make changes to the system would have to go to all these different places in order to do so. And they have to be going around all the different folder structure to say, well, I have to go here to add this new uh, page to the screen, uh, but I also have to go over there to be able to do this thing, and over here to do the view model thing, and over there to do the views thing. Um, and so they have to go just traverse all these different places to be able to just do something as simple as add, a, uh, add an input to the screen. So I looked at all this and said, I think, I think we got off somewhere in that we were organizing all of our uh, application code by type. So I put all the, all the views together, all of the controllers together, all of the models together. But when I'm making a change in the system, I'm having to go all over the place to be able to just add the most basic functionality. And if I look at how users interact with the system and how uh, developers change the system, we found that they aren't going across these different, uh, these different layers. Instead, what they're doing is working within a single, what I call them, vertical slice of functionality between all these different kinds of behaviors in the system. So in this case, if I have different behaviors that are going on in my system, um, I, ideally, I can just work within one area and make sure that I don't affect any other kind of feature going on in the system. So this led me towards uh, what I called a vertical slice architecture. In a vertical slice architecture, we model and organize the application architecture around the axes of change, or vertical slices. And this was really the, the breakthrough for me personally, was not just the kind of divvying up res of responsibilities into specific kinds of things like, well, validations are here, and business logic is over there, and data access is there. It's really looking at, well, if I'm making a change to the system, wouldn't it be nice if everything that was related to a specific uh, action or feature or set of functionality was all together as well. And so that's what these vertical slices became. A vertical slice is all about taking all the different things related to a, a single feature or single request or, or action in my application or task and moving those all into one specific place. And what this leads me to, though, is start to break up a lot of these layered, uh, layered classes that stretch across different slices or requests in my application. So for example, my domain services. My domain services would have all these different methods for the different kinds of things you could do with that domain object or that aggregate. And so in so this case, I have an invoice service that I can approve it, I can reject it, or I can flag it. But if I look at the use cases, like when do these methods actually get called in my system? At no point in any request on my application do I call more than one of these methods. So if I'm looking at this from a purely solid perspective, this violates the interface segregation principle because I never use all of these methods at one single time. I only use one method at a time. So he said, let's, let's, let's break this up then. If I'm having a lot of contention over these, these, these classes that span so many different responsibilities, how about we take each of those individual things that it does and break each of those things if it does into individual classes? Each of these individual classes or types represents those individual things you can do in the system based on what the uh, overall application is allowing you to perform. So I'm taking that method and I'm just saying, instead of making a single method in a big class, I'm just going to have a class that represents performing whatever that action is. Now, as we started to go towards this kind of architecture, where we're taking, I mean, this is, basically standard refactoring techniques where I'm taking individual methods and building classes out of those methods, we saw that those, those classes on the right started to have a lot of similarities, but a lot of pointless uh, divergences. And as we created these different individual action classes or task classes, uh, we noticed that as developers were creating these, um, they, each, they were each getting created uh, and design individually without any sort of uh, vision towards the whole, or trying to make any sort of consistency between these. So we saw this and said, okay, what's, what's really going on here is my application accepts requests and returns responses. Most of our systems that I build are web applications, and the HTTP protocol is effectively a kind of a request response uh, style communication. And so each of these different classes represents the ability to make some sort of request to my system and do something and return some sort of response. So he said, let's model that explicitly. Let's model the system as some input that goes into something that handles that input and that produces 
some kind of output. And so those service classes that went to individual service method classes eventually boiled down to individual request handlers. So I have a request coming in and a response coming out. I know it seems like stupid and simple, um, but uh, by going towards this sort of architecture, we were able to uh, build a common interface around all of our different requests. And so I actually built an open source library in the .NET world called Mediator. Um, in which it basically implements the mediator pattern of a request coming in, and now that is represented by some class that implements I, uh, interface of I request of T. The T is going to be the response type. And so this request handler accepts a request and returns a response. Now, if I was in a functional language, then this could all be represented as kind of first class primitives in, functional, in, a, in a functional paradigm. But we're not in a functional language. I'm in C Sharp, uh, which is object-oriented, even though it has kind of functional-ish qualities to it. It's not really a functional language, so I don't have things like uh, partial application or currying or monads or any of those other kind of fancy functional things. So I'm going to center my application architecture around types and objects. And so we'll have an object that represents a request, an object that represents handling that request, and finally, another object that represents that response. Now, everything is async these days, so that's why my method now returns a task of response, because it's going to return that promise as opposed to just the response itself. Now, in, uh, in our systems, we want to make this super, super easy to be able to register all of these different handlers with dependency injection. And so for us, it's just one line that says, go find all the different handlers in my application and register those handlers with a container so they can now use dependency injection very easily as well. So with this request response and a handler, now I can go back to my application and say, OK, uh, now that I have some way to represent performing work, how does that actually translate back into my overall applications? And so my system for web applications, like everything is either a get or post. Like I know there are other HTTP verbs out there, um, or methods, that is, and uh, like put, put patch and all the other ones. But for the systems I build, it's basically gets and posts. And if you look at what those actually represent, in a semantic view, gets represent a query for information, and posts represent a command. And so a query uh, can be translated to some kind of object to represent I'm asking for information, a handler that's saying, OK, now I need to get that information, and the response is then, OK, now how do I return that information back to the user? And a post is a similar thing. A post is a command that has a request to perform some operation, a handler to do the thing that you want it to do, and then finally some response that says, you know, was it, was it successful or not, or maybe there's something more complicated here. So this kind of architecture naturally led us towards uh, organizing our applications into commands and queries. And this was also named as well. So this is also known as the Command Query Responsibility Segregation Pattern, or CQRS, at its most basic form, where I'm just having two objects to represent commands and queries, where before we had one, which were our services and repositories. The other big thing that we wanted to do and, uh, with, our, with our systems was to make sure that uh, our handlers were completely encapsulated. And the way we could do that is to ensure that all of the inputs required to be able to perform that operation were represented in those incoming models. And all the information I needed to be able to get back to the end user, whatever that might mean, was going to be in those overall responses on the other side. So we had one model in and one model out. And the other big thing we did is we never tried to share any of these different queries, commands, or handlers between individual requests in my system. So that means that an individual request has some object coming in. I don't care what's going on underneath the covers. It's, it's just getting handled by some handler. And then finally, there's some kind of response on the other side. So we have complete encapsulation over whatever work is going to be done underneath the covers here. I think that's the Windows logo. That was not intentional whatsoever. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about what it actually looks like in a real system to build these requests, these handlers, and these responses. Because it seems simple. It's like, OK, just. Well, put everything in these different objects, and then everything is good for you after, the, after that. But this is radically different than you see most um, kind of recommended architectures uh, coming out of people that build these kinds of things. So if you look at um, kind of like the, the traditional uh, Microsoft-based architectures or the Java-based architectures, none of them really model information like this. So it took a lot of learning on our part just to figure out, well, what do these things look like? How does, how does this affect our overall code base? <clears throat> 
So first up was looking at um, how do we actually model these, these incoming queries? So this, this is a type that represents a request for information. So the first thing we had were very, very simple queries. So a simple query would be, um, I have a specific request for information, but I don't have to provide you any additional information along with that request. So in this case, it's an empty type. That is, there, there's nothing else you need to know other than the type of this request to be able to get that overall response. Now, one of the things I'm doing here as well is I'm organizing my requests and response objects in the overall request and response hierarchy of the system. So in this case, there's an index page on some overall uh, set of uh, functionality. And so I'm making sure that this functionality, this request, is then uh, completely inside of that overall uh, set of request uh, objects. So in this case, the query is a inner type of the index class. Um, and sometimes we've done inner classes, other times we've just done organizational structures like folders and whatnot. But we wanted to make sure that this class was very close to everything else that had to deal with whatever that query was going to be. Now, that's a simple query. Sometimes these get more complicated. So if I look at an individual request, I say, well, how can things get more complicated? Well, sometimes there may be like parameters to my query. So this could be like query string parameters, for example, with web applications. So what I do is take all the other inputs to be able to handle that query and model those as individual properties on my overall query object. So in this case, this web request has two query string parameters, and those are just simply represented as individual data properties on my query object. Now, I can get really complicated, like maybe you have searching and paging and filtering. Basically, take any of the kind of inputs to be able to perform that query and just represent those as individual inputs and properties on my request object. And the overall goal here is to be able to take this request object, give it to the handler, and the handler can do everything necessary based purely off of those inputs to be able to perform its work. Now, the responses. Uh, those really depend on how I need to surface back that information to the end user. So for something like a, a server-side application, does anyone still do like server-side web? Or are we just all on spas now and React and junk? Well, I still like server-side web applications. So we still do have these sometimes where that response is not something I'd have by itself. That response is really handed off into a, a view or template renderer to take that response and actually render something to the screen, HTML or whatever it might be. So I'm going to tailor that response to exactly what the view needs to be able to, be able to render what, is, what we see in the screen. So I'm just taking all the data points I see in the screen and building a response object that represents only that information that I could see on the screen and nothing else, nothing more. Now, this is radically different than a lot of MVC architectures, things like Ruby on Rails, for example. There's no such concept of these response or view models. What you typically see in those kinds of systems is I'm directly handing off to the view a like, live ORM connected object, which means that if I like, loop over things and render them in a table, it could do all sorts of wacky things. So we said, we're not going to do that. We're going to create these very dumb DTOs or data transfer objects that represent only the information that is necessary to be able to either render the information to the screen or respond back to the end user. And that's exactly what this model represents. We could have complex models, so we could have like, uh, like a summary detail view. So I could have lists of information as part of this. And one of the things we wanted to do is make sure that if I needed to change this response, I wasn't affecting anybody else. And how can I ensure that? Well, in this case, what I'm doing is, this is a page that's showing some, uh, some summary detail information in a list. But the list of information, I'm actually modeling that type as an inner type as well to ensure that no one else like accidentally grabs that set of information or that type to be able to show on the screen. If this model is only meant for that one screen, then I don't want to ensure that the type information is also encapsulated to say, I'm only using it in this one specific place. Now, a lot of times, we'd actually see uh, kind of a duality between commands and queries. So if I look at a typical like a web page with a form, well, I have to make an initial request to show the information to the end user, and then I click the button to post that information back up. So it's actually two requests. There's going to be an initial query to show information on the screen, and that's represented by the command model, so it's like the form on the screen. But then when they hit the submit button, I'm actually using that same object to represent the command DTO to be able to process that request on the other side. So with that, let's go actually look at modeling commands. Now, commands are, are another kind of request response, but they're going to be a bit different than queries. Queries are about getting data. Commands are about doing something. 
So for the commands, the commands uh, requests are really gonna be about what are all the inputs that I need to do uh, to give to the handler to be able to perform that operation. So a lot of times this is just like, what are all the form fields on the screen and represent that set of form fields with an individual class. So however this information gets shown to the screen, that gets bound back up through the magic of web frameworks to be able to, to populate those individual command objects to be able to be then passed to the request handler. So for us, we build a lot of task-based user interfaces. So instead of user interfaces that are just like very CRUD-oriented, it's like all these edit buttons, and um, I know that's what the, the user actually wants. They just want Excel. Uh, but we try to build these kind of task-based UIs that represent the individual operations the user wants to perform. So in this case, instead of just having edit students for all their information, we looked at what are all the different things that the user's trying to do and build out individual links and forms for each one of those operations. So be able to transfer a student from one class to the other. Um, in that case, I'd have an individual request representing the form on the screen, a handler to be able to perform that operation, and then some kind of response based on whatever I need to get back to the end user. And so each of these individual actions we're modeling in the user interface become individual request handling pipelines for all those different requests and responses. So this means if I want to change how a, how a student is scheduled versus how a student is transferred, notice that those are two completely separate sets of objects for request handling and responses and on the screen. So I can have that safety knowing that if I need to make a change to one part of the system or application, I know that I'm not going to affect anything else in the system. And for us, that was, like a, that, was a, that was one of our huge breakthroughs in this kind of architecture, is that we didn't really have to worry about uh, like accidentally stepping on other people's toes, or more likely, if we have these kind of God service uh, classes and God repositories, if I change behavior there, how many other requests am I affecting? In this case, I am guaranteed that if I make a change in one place, I'm not affecting anyone else in the system. What about those responses for commands? Now this is the this is the, the this is where kind of the uh, our our approach sort of sometimes differs than a lot of the object oriented uh, recommendations out there because what we what I had seen for a very long time was this idea of command query separation that a method should either do something or return something but not do both. But from a system application perspective, that doesn't make a lot of sense because if I hit a button on a screen, uh, then I'm going to get some sort of feedback from the web application whether this thing was successful or not. I can have different response codes to be like, well, this was good, uh, this was bad because it's your fault, this is bad because it's my fault, and then a lot more details. So we had to like, make sure that the responses are able to handle these different kinds of scenarios for what could go right or wrong inside my handler. I mean, the simplest one would be just void. Uh, I just perform some operation and I don't tell you what happened. It's just like, well, I did the thing and it happened or it didn't. You don't know. Uh, I could have some kind of response though um, where I, I actually give them some kind of feedback about what happened with this request. So it could be like good, bad, true, false, success, fail. They said, okay, my request returns a Boolean that tells you whether it was successful or not. I could tell you uh, in the case of creation, that says, I created this thing, and here's the ID of the thing that I just created, and so now I can build out a URL to redirect the user to, to say, okay, you tried to create this thing, uh, and now I'll redirect you to the page that is now the thing that you just created, or provide some kind of URL to say, this is the thing that's, uh, that, that I just created for you. But it can get way more complicated than this. Uh, so we've gone, uh, we've, we can do things like domain validation and success and failure reasons and other models. So you can get pretty crazy with this. We have like a really complex result that has the payload, has failure reasons. It tells you if it's successful or not. It has like all sorts of helper methods to say whether, whether the thing succeeded or not. You can get kind of crazy with this. So I, I kind of, I take the approach of keeping things as simple as possible and only adding these more complex payloads as the, Really, the code tells me that we need this, this additional complexity. So that was requests and responses. But the meat of the application are going to be inside these individual handlers. And so initially, what we did when we started modeling these handlers, we first did a defactoring session. Has anyone heard of the word, the term defactoring? 
So defactoring is the opposite of refactoring. Refactoring is, is factoring code into individual components. Defactoring is rolling all of that back. And so we went through this defactoring session where we removed all the services, all the repositories, all those kind of like layered types and stuff, and just put everything in the UI. Just like, the, if we were using MVC, put everything in the controller. If you were using uh, APIs, then put just everything in the API. And so, okay, now let's just take all the code that's in there and move it to these handlers. So if I'm using an MVC application, that means that every single action that's in my controller, I take the meat of that code and stick it inside an individual handler. Sometimes these can be simple. I can just project based on my ORM. And so in this case, it's using a link select projection to do uh, showing information on a screen. Uh, or I could use SQL projections. Um, it really doesn't matter. Um, whatever I, I want to do inside of my handler to be able to handle this query is completely encapsulated inside of that one individual object. So I could have one query that goes to my like, fancy, fancy ORM to perform its work to get its response. Or if I'm using micro ORMs to do more raw SQL stuff, well, I can do that as well. If I have one other handler that needs to actually call an API to do something else, or if there's some other kind of like mystery meat grinder, that sausage factory thing that's doing, I don't know what. Um, but the key here is that each of these different handlers is encapsulated about how it decides to take this query and transform it into an individual response. Now, I want to actually suggest mixing all these things in one single application, uh, ex especially the meat grinder. But we do have that ability now to decide on a request-by-request -request basis what makes the most sense for this individual query to be able to most efficiently return that response. Now, there are some times, this is somewhat rare, that we do have some kind of duplication between individual query handlers. It doesn't happen terribly often. Usually, it's just like, Copied of uh, code I've copied three times um, to like get some base information, and that's when the that's when you're like, well, is it actually common code or is just incidentally duplicated, but not as actually duplicated code? So in those cases, when I have this kind of common code, we can use standard refactoring techniques to pull it into some kind of common something. It could be a common class or function or extension method. What I don't want to do though is introduce any kind of inheritance hierarchies into my application, because again, um, that's going to be introducing uh, some coupling in my system if I have to have some kind of convoluted inheritance hierarchy here. Now, queries are, are pretty simple, but when you get to the real meat of the application, that's going to be your command handlers. Command handlers are actually performing work that has value to the user because they're making changes to the system. They want to perform operations. So ha command handlers are really where we have to use a lot of our uh, OO techniques to make sure that those things don't get terribly ugly. But what I like to do, though, is start as simple as possible. So make them as dumb and simple as I possibly can and make it the stupidest thing that could possibly work. So in the red, green refactor step, this is the green step. Like, make the dumbest code that could possibly work. And then if it looks OK at that point, then we can just stop. One thing we also do as well, though, is we didn't introduce any kind of abstractions over any kind of other services that we were using. So for example, in this case, instead of me trying to abstract away the ORM, I'm just using that ORM directly. And the motivation here is that uh, if I went through this defactoring uh, process, removing all these abstractions, removing all these layers, then the code itself should tell me through code smells whether I need to add those abstractions back in. So that's the exact approach we took. So we will add in these abstractions over different external services or different dependencies uh, if and when, when and if, if and when, uh, the code itself tells us it's difficult to use. So what about complexity? What happens when things get ugly inside of those command handlers? Well, first of all, uh, we want to make sure like, people don't panic. Like, just because we got rid of all these layers uh, doesn't mean we, we have just a, a spaghetti code of mess inside of each of those handlers. Uh, we want to do that last step that everyone skips, the refactor step in our code to say, uh, OK, now that I've written the code and the test passes, now how do I take that code and produce clean, nice, beautiful code, whatever that might be? But to do so, we'll just use the standard refactoring techniques that have already been very, very well documented and supported by all of the kind of 
major IDEs out there. So Visual Studio, VS Code, um, any of the JetBrains tools, Eclipse, they all support the ability to make these kinds of structural changes safely to your code. So if I see uh, basically the two code smells that I've run into the most, a long class or a long method, then it can use standard refactoring techniques supported by the tooling to be able to address those code smells. So it could be extracting a class, extracting a subclass, extracting an interface, or re replacing method with method object. Uh, but the big ones that I see in building my systems uh, for refactorings are going to be compose method, which we'll get to in a little bit, uh, moving method, and extracting methods. So those three at the bottom are the three that I have to get really good at in order to make sure that those individual handlers don't get ugly. Now, sometimes it can get a little bit more complicated than that. And so my favorite uh, refactoring techniques and, this, and, and individual methods may not actually work. And so for those, I actually start to look at ref larger refactoring patterns. And my favorite pattern book is not the Gang of Four Patterns book, which is just a list of patterns that developers treat like a checklist. Uh, and like they get to the bridge pattern and they're like, I don't even know what the hell this is all about. But this book tells you if I have a set of code that exhibits code smells, here are some refactoring techniques to refactor towards or away from those design patterns. So if I see these individual uh, behavior of smells, then there are specific design patterns that can address these kinds of code smells I see uh, cropping up in my individual handlers. So you, can, you may be able to replace some of these with like strategy patterns or chains of responsibility, chain of responsibilities, chains of responsibility patterns, um, in order to address this, these larger design behavioral smells that I see cropping up in my code. So a good example of this. Um, we had a handler that was too big. It was doing too much stuff. And uh, I could have made the font even smaller, but basically this method ends somewhere like at the floor down over there, uh, all the different work it's going to do. So I'm looking at this and saying, I don't know what's going on. So the first step is add code comments, right? No, we don't add comments. We refactor the code. So the first step I do would be do something like uh, the compose method pattern, which is basically taking each logical group of statements, they're doing one operation, and extracting methods for each of those. But what I'd like to do is have a more purposeful directed refactoring. And so we do a lot of domain-driven design, or at least we think we do anyway, uh, where the names match things and we're using ubiquitous language and all that sort of junk. Uh, but there's one final piece, which is a fully encapsulated behavioral domain model. So if I'm starting with this very procedural set of code, what I can do is use refactoring to be able to push that behavior from the handler down into the domain. So all that code that was dealing with the business logic, I actually replaced with one single method that is now on my domain object as opposed to inside of this handler. There's two refactorings I do for that, or three, I guess. Uh, the first thing I do would be to extract the method inside of this class. Then I could move the method from that class to the other class. And then at that point, I can see does it need additional refactoring. So then I'll go look at my domain and said, ooh, that's, uh, that's still ugly. Uh, the code still ends like down here somewhere. So then I'd use the compose method refactoring, which is taking each set of operations that kind of logically represent the same set of uh, complexity and extract individual message methods for each of those different things it's doing. So in this case, it was doing two things. It was updating the base detail information and that had some more complicated stuff on the screen. And so there's a separate method, which was to deal with that additional set of complexity. So now, uh, I try to represent this on the list, now my handler becomes much thinner because it's basically just doing data access, get the thing, delegate to the domain, and then save the thing. And then the domain is actually doing the bulk of the work. Now, no system is, is, in, is complete without some kind of validation to do the work. And so we looked at this and said, um, you know, typically what I see in validation uh, in the sample applications that I deal with have validation on the domain itself or on the data objects themselves. So you, you have the, the kind of data object that you're saving to the database and you have all these kind of decorations, attributes, annotations that say, well, this is this specific length and this can't be that big. But for us, we don't want to validate an object after it's already been changed. What we really want to do is validate the requests. So I can have different validation rules that apply for each individual request. So perhaps transferring a student has different validation rules than uh, rescheduling a student, something like that. 
But we also found that we can have different levels of validation. So we have the, the, these kind of two main levels of validation that can go on with any individual request. The first level of validation is really just about uh, have you filled in all the junk correctly on the form? So making sure that like, the fields are filled in properly, that they, have, they don't exceed length requirements, that, uh, that maybe even like, dates are correct and things like that. Those are, those are validation rules that I can just look at the request object by itself and, val and, and, um, and evaluate. But there's sometimes when I have to have more complex validation. So maybe I have to look at the existing state. So things like, well, you can only approve an invoice if the invoice hasn't been canceled. Well, to be able to, to, be able to validate that, I'd actually have to go get and look at the original invoice and say, oops, this invoice has been canceled. You can't approve this, so it's, you can't actually perform this operation. But to do that, I have to go reach into the system to get additional information that is not present on the uh, initial request. So request validation, there's a lot of frameworks out there to do this, so I, I usually pick the dumbest thing that could possibly work, whether it's attribute annotation-based validation. Uh, this is a tool in .NET called Fluent Validation, and we, we like it because it's very centered on uh, individual types, so I can build validators for types and have this kind of fluency syntax to be able to describe what are the validation rules for those individual requests. But for domain validation, this is where things get complicated. Um, because I may have to look at existing state to be able to figure out, is this thing OK to do or not? So that's where these frameworks really break down. Validation frameworks are great for kind of simple validation, where I'm just looking at the form. But as soon as I go past that and start looking at the existing state, it becomes complicated. So that's why I start to look at these result objects, where a domain object can not only perform the operation itself, but can also tell you whether this thing can be successful or not. So my domain now becomes not just the, the encapsulation of performing actions, but also feedback to tell me, can you actually perform this action based on the state that I'm in? So in this case, I've got a method that says, um, I'm trying to approve an invoice. And what it's doing is checking the, cert the status of the invoice and saying, uh, based on the status, what it's going to actually perform the operation or return you a reason why I can't do this. So in this case, if the status is rejected, I'm returning a failure result saying, I can't approve a rejected order. So you will see some thing in the screen that says, you can't approve a rejected order. Um, and then the user will get sad, I guess. <clears throat> so the last piece is really looking at uh, how I actually build these responses for the screen. So in the case of... Uh, web applications, those responses really represent uh, representations in the RESTful sense. So if I look at my application now, um, my controller becomes kind of dumb. Like, it's just not doing a whole lot. So this MVC controller, it's, it's really just delegating off to, the, to a mediator to be able to send these requests out and get the responses back. And what you notice on the right, though, is that I've actually organized all of the different types in my system around each of the individual slices. So on the right, I've got the view for uh, creating or editing something right next to all of the types that represent the request, the response, handling the thing, validating. Those are all, uh, all together. Uh, ASP.NET Core also introduced the concept of Razor Pages. And these are now fully encapsulated request handlers. So instead of having this, having this kind of weird controller object that kind of does a whole bunch of different requests, instead I have individual objects and, and pages that represent each individual request. So now it becomes more of a component-oriented architecture as opposed to these kind of these classes that, that span all these different requests. So for those of you that are doing a lot of React or Vue, this is a very natural sort of fit for you because uh, you're already trying to encapsulate individual parts in the screen into components. And so we're doing a very similar thing with our server side as well, is encapsulating everything necessary to, be, to, to perform that operation and set to a single set of classes in one place. Uh, yeah, I'm going to that. Now, web APIs are a little different. Because in a web API, I may be, uh, I may be exposing information for a single page application in which that single page application doesn't refresh the entire screen uh, to be able to do stuff. So in that case, I have a bunch of different operations that user can perform, each of those with individual handlers to perform their work, but they're not getting redirected somewhere else or moving around in the application. They're going back to that one individual screen. So typically, those systems actually 
return a shared response type because that response type is tailored toward a single view or component on the screen. So in these kinds of systems, I, I, you know, most of the time, reuse is a four-letter word. I know it's five letters, but that's the, <laughs> that's the, the term we use. And the, the general uh, approach is we try not to reuse anything between each of these individual handlers to ensure that if I need to change one of these handlers, I'm not affecting anything else in the system. The caveat is I may be having a single response type that I'm having to expose to one single page on the screen. So in that case, I would have a single type representing that response. Now, there may be cases where I start to have cross-cutting concerns across different requests in my application. And when we started to see this crop up uh, more and more, we, what we didn't want to do was add a bunch of like, weird inheritance hierarchies and things like that to be able to address this. We wanted to, have, uh, we wanted to introduce um, composition as opposed to inheritance to be able to compose these different behaviors. So we, what we wound up doing is implementing the decorator pattern for these individual handlers. So I could decorate each individual handler with additional behaviors to be able to perform some sort of cross-cutting concern across each request of my application. And these could stack as well. So I could have the, the very low-level handler that's doing the real business logic, but on top of that stack, uh, additional behaviors to be able to be performed uh, with each individual request. So a lot of frameworks have this concept already, and so I just stole that idea and put it into our mediator concept. Um, decorators are not that easy to do in a lot of object-oriented languages, um, especially with dependency injection and all the things like that. So while it's super easy to do in functional languages, um, we found that most object-oriented languages uh, can't do that easily, so we have to represent our decorators as individual objects. And so that's what we have here, our pipeline behavior is something that wraps around every single request. And in that pipeline behavior, we have received the request, we receive a continuation or a delegate to the next operation that we can call, and then finally we need to return a response. So one example would be something like transactions, like the thing that developers forget to do, like wrap requests and operations and transactions. Well, with this behavior, we can ensure that every single request in our system is surrounded by a transaction, but that, that transaction is only around the individual handler, not around like the whole, whole web request. So what we have here is uh, we call out to begin the transaction. We await the next operation, whatever that might be. We don't know what it is. We commit the transaction and return the response. But if something goes wrong, we catch the exception and roll it back. Now, I'm using a lot of kind of generic magic here behind the scenes, so you notice that this class is also generic, so we're not tying ourselves into a specific request and a specific re response. Um, and then just C Sharp being very, very good at generics lets us do this for us all behind the scenes. Sometimes we have units of work. Um, so in this case, we were using some kind of uh, document database, MongoDB, that we wanted to do multi-document transactions, so we had to introduce a unit of work, and so we'd uh, we would perform the next operation, which could be a handler, and the final thing would be complete the unit of work. We can do concurrency uh, exceptions and retries. So in this case, if, if we're trying to save an object and we get some sign of very, some very specific concurrency exception, then we can retry our entire operation again and just perform this with an individual behavior. Logging is another good example. So I can say, uh, before I perform the operation and after I perform the operation, log some information about what's going on. Hopefully I'm conforming to all the GDPR junk here as well. Make sure I'm not logging people's passwords or whatever. Um, but the, the idea is to look at, okay, now look, I'm looking across different handlers. What are the kinds of things I'm trying to do in every single handler that is not really specific to each individual request? And represent those as these behaviors that basically turn into these kind of, this kind of like Matryoshka Russian doll uh, idea. And so I reg register each of these behaviors in order that I want them to be performed, and uh, I, I allow them to be able to handle any kind of request and any kind of response. Now through all of this, um, I usually get a lot of pushback with uh, the testing aspect of, well, what happens now that I got rid of all those service and repositories that I used to mock out in my, in my classes? So in my tests, I could mock out the services, mock out the repositories, and everything ran great. 
Um, but what we found in practice is when I have all those, those like really important things mocked out, like repositories mocked out, my unit test could pass and I run the application and it, and it blows up. So if my unit test passes, but the application still blows up, then my unit test isn't providing the value I was hoping it was doing. So when we looked at this, we said, well, how do we want to approach testing in this kind of application? When I get to the handler, if I'm testing the handler, um, do I write unit tests for each of these individual pieces? Um, what, are the unit, what are my tests wind up looking like? But we found, though, is that in this kind of, uh, this kind of organization where everything flows through handlers, um, this kind of request handler response now begins to look very much like the arrange, act, assert for tests. Arranging is building everything I need to do for the request. Acting is just calling the handler. And asserting is then looking at the response. As much as possible, this is a bunch of junk code, but we wanted to reproduce reality. So instead of having everything mocked out behind the scenes, we wanted to build our handlers as if they could be running in production. Now, we're not actually going to be sending web requests down because that is slow, but can I build the handlers in such a way that it's actually using all the real pieces behind the scenes so that I have a very high degree of confidence that if that test succeeds or fails, then it has very high likelihood of succeeding when it actually runs. So this is basically copying all the sort of startup code in our application, and, in our app, and then our tests, we're trying to mimic the application as much as possible. So we found that in each individual request and application, it creates scopes for uh, scopes for, for, for executing actions. So we did the same thing in here as well. We were creating scopes to perform individual actions against your application. And the general idea here is that when I'm using the application, I'm, I'm sending requests, and they're, and they're performing some operation and coming back. But each of, those, each of those times I make a request and response, it's stateless. So the, the server is not holding any state between requests. The state is actually on the database. And I'm performing actual database transactions as well. So we wanted to do that as well. It's like, if I need to perform operations, do all these things inside individual transactions, because that's actually going to map exactly how the user performs things. Sending requests down as well is just uh, getting the mediator and sending a request down. And then in our test now, we can use a feature I never thought I was going to use, which are static helpers uh, from one of the recent versions of C Sharp. So when I look at my test, it actually reads now kind of like a DSL that says, I'm going to uh, await sending this request down to create or edit something. And I get a response back on the other side. And then when I actually assert my, uh, my responses, I'm just sending a request, getting the response, and now I'm just asserting based on the response I find. And because each of these different operations our individual transactions, I have a high degree of confidence that this will perform exactly like it does in production. So um, we want to make sure as well that we send all of our data through the front door. Um, so that is, we are trying to use the requests as they actually are in the system. Uh, if we need to set up data that we can't do through the front door through regular requests, then we'll just insert those directly. But when I'm actually uh, testing these things, we wanted to make sure that every single operation is actually doing a full round trip with a database uh, behind the scenes as well. So each of these different operations, to send a command, find the thing, these are all full round trips to a local test database that each de developer has. So it winds up looking something like this, where I've got unit tests for the thing that is actually isolated, which is the domain. The thing that I'd pushed all the behavior down into, that is the thing that's going to have unit tests. And then integration tests are going to be th everything uh, on the outside. So some key takeaways. Uh, vertical slices make it really easy for us to add, change, and delete code, as we heard from this morning's uh, morning keynote. It's, it's important to delete code as well. Um, we do not want to skip the refactor step. So make the handler as dumb as possible. But yes, still do that red-green refactor step. We want to push behavior down into our domain as much as possible. And then finally, we want to integration test our handlers, but unit test the domain, the thing that is actually isolated. So say no to these circular uh, vegetable sorry, architectures and say yes to vertical slice architectures like Celery. And you too can have a very maintainable system over time. Thank you very much. If you want to see the code behind here, it's on my github.com slash jbogard, uh, the full running example. Otherwise, thank you very much, and I hope you have a great rest of the presentation.